The land of U 1000 years in the future has gone through many changes. Some kingdoms fell to ruin, while other kingdoms arose and prospered, like the Pup Kingdom. The second promo image for the sixth season episode, Grable's 1000 Plus, was our first glance at the Pup Kingdom, although I doubt any of us realized exactly what we were looking at back then. Steve Wolfhard, a writer and storyboarder for Adventure Time, recently tweeted about this image now that we've seen the finale, and also included a fun little detail about how apparently the Hot Dog Kingdom is thriving in the future. Steve Wolfhard's notes and drawings will actually form the basis of this video, as he's been heavily invested in thinking about pups. Wolfhard has posted his Every Pup Has a Power concept art online recently, stating that he thinks, with the speed that pups age, I figure Oo will be lousy with pups in 1000 years. Pup number 414, Herm, has the power of division. Pup number 6791, Jess, can create holographic images. Pup number 7006, Raisin, has a power Wolfhard called Holy shit! In which she basically becomes a magical explosion that petrifies anything in its blast radius. Wolfhard states he's a fan of characters that are overwhelmingly powerful to the point that they feel like walking nukes, and some of the pups, such as Raisin, fall into this category. Wolfhard also states that he thinks Sweet Pea is such a character, so that's a fun little detail on the sheer power adult Sweet Pea wields. Let's now finally get to a pup that actually appears in the Come Along With Me custom opening sequence, Gibbon! We first saw Gibbon in a tarot-like ritualistic vision of the future Charlie had in the episode Daddy Daughter Card Wars. Also, I'm naming you Gibbon. Based off Wolfhard's notes, Gibbon is a major character when it comes to shaping the land of Ooh over the course of 1000 years. Gibbon is pup number 7, so if Jake's batch of kids are pups 1 through 5, and Bronwyn is pup number 6, that means Charlie is the first pup after Kim Kilwan to have a child. Gibbon's power is called Peepee, -pee, which, yeah, you're just gonna have to use your imagination for what effect that might have. Before I discuss the interesting note of it being stolen, though, let's talk about that jewel in Gibbon's eye and the new powers it has granted him. I noticed that the finalized Gibbon design that made it into the Come Along With Me intro has switched which eye socket the jewel ended up in, and that the new orientation matches the missing jewel of the ice thing. Perhaps the reason the Gibbon concept art had the jewel placement in the right eye is because original concept art for the ice thing also had the missing jewel on the right side, but this orientation was flipped when the actual episode of Grable's 1000 Plus was produced. Matching the sides between the two characters is a nice touch and makes absolute sense because it's strongly implied that Gibbon took this jewel from the ice thing and utilized its power for himself from the intro alone, and if you want to consider Wolfhard's notes as an extension of the canon, well, then it becomes as close to confirmed as it can possibly get without being stated outright. We know that the Ice Crown grants the person that it bonds with immortality, ice powers, and mania, and it seems like Gibbon might have all three of those. The immortality is pretty self-explanatory, and is the reason why Gibbon is still alive at nearly 1,000 years of age. Gibbon's ice powers are differentiated by being pink, but the lightning bolt-shaped blasts he fires appear just like those of classic Ice King, apart from the color. Gibbon does use a crystal staff to create the ice, perhaps it's a necessary tool for him to channel the jewel's power, and he can't properly summon pink ice without it. And when it comes to mania, Wolfhard's drawings suggest Gibbon might have some serious mother issues. I think there's an implication that there was a strained or troubled past between the two. The lack of any mention of a romantic partner during Charlie's visions in Daddy Daughter Card Wars gave me the impression Charlie was a single mother the entire time she raised Gibbon, and that her life wasn't a very stable or comfortable one. While pregnant in her 30s, I look lost. In her 40s, after she had Gibbon, I'm afraid. And in her 50s, when Gibbon steps out of her life and sets out on his own, Charlie is having a midlife crisis. Good luck, Gibbon! 
Now, Charlie does merge with the vague representation of herself at 90 years of age when she's feeling content and wise, but it's unclear just how much this changes the future that she foresaw for herself. It's not like the ritual actually allowed her to live out a life and learn from experiences directly. It seemed more like an intensive, fortune-telling session that allowed her to broaden her overall perspective and outlook, but not necessarily restructure her life when it comes to the nitty-gritty details. After all, the first time we see her after Daddy-Daughter Card Wars, Charlie is just enjoying living an aimless and slobbish life. Which, nothing wrong with that, of course. It just showcases that Charlie's lifestyle is still one without direction. And then it goes without saying that Charlie still obviously does get preggers with Gibbon eventually. But I'm not trying to turn this into a video about Charlie, I swear. I'm just speculating about Gibbon's mommy issues. To be fair, perhaps Gibbon's mania doesn't have anything to do with a jewel, maybe it's simply Gibbon's personality and living for nearly a thousand years just made it more extreme? I doubt that though, I'd wager that when you tap into the jewel's magic to get its beneficial powers, the negative side effects are gonna tag along as well. Speaking of when Gibbon acquired the jewel, or perhaps I should say stole the jewel, we don't know how old Turtle Princess was during the series, and we're not sure what the lifespan of a pup is, and that probably varies as well depending on what parents it had, but you'd probably expect for a turtle, animals that are extremely long-lived in real life, to outlive a pup, even if that pup was born well after the turtle. I hope all of you can see where I'm going with this. I think it's very possible for Gibbon to have stolen the Ice Crown Jewel before Turtle Princess died of old age, and this may have resulted in quite some tragedy. When a jewel is removed from the Ice Crown, it seems like it still contributes towards powering the Ice Crown's magic. After all, we've seen the jewel removed and put back into place before, and Ice Thane remains unaffected when the jewel becomes an engagement ring. However, after Gibbon got his hands on the jewel, he must have reprogrammed its magical functions to serve him, and thus that magical supply would become cut off from the Ice Thing, and this could be the reason why the Ice Thing's appearance changes from the bird-legged version we saw at the end of Come Along With Me, to this new version that's nearly all beard that features in the opening sequence. I would imagine that the two-jewel ice thing would behave differently and be even more erratic. It would be a debased version of the ice thing that married Turtle Princess. This would obviously cause a major shift in their relationship for the worse. Classic Ice King's state of mind is rather analogous to dementia, it's been compared to this since nearly the start of the series, and such a scenario with Ice Thane and Turtle Princess would just further continue that tragic thematic comparison. Gibbon stealing the jewel and debasing the ice thing also sets up further reason for the two to have an antagonistic relationship, which is portrayed in the opening when Gibbon fires at the ice thing after he performs a flyby. The potential storyline between these two characters is pretty heavy stuff. Alright, so let's finally switch gears a little bit and talk about the Pup Kingdom, which Gibbon does seem to be the ruler of, or if not ruler, he at least seems to be a prominent figure within it and certainly has a hand in running the show. The Pup Kingdom regularly fires pods into space, and my bet is it sends up resources judging by all the cargo trucks we see entering the kingdom in the opening. In Grable's 1000 Plus, we also see a space wedding, so the space travel is sophisticated enough that it can even be done for leisure activities. Pups are probably quite well versed in space exploration, and perhaps have even colonized other worlds. I wouldn't put it past them. The crystalline structure of the spaceships, floating platforms, spacesuits, and even Gibbon's staff suggests that the Crystal Dimension may be the foundation or basis to the Pup Kingdom's technology. The geology of the entrance to the Crystal Realm, as well as the area where Tree Trunks ended up after eating the Crystal Apple, remind me a bunch of the technology the pups are using when it comes to appearance. I mean, it's possible that the letter C in the insignia actually stands for Crystal. 
Although it's of course also possible that this is a superficial similarity, but I tend to think it's not, especially since the pups in the spacesuits speak Korean. <laughs> further driving that association to Rainicorns and the Crystal Dimension. Let's talk about these spacesuit-wearing pups, because they're rather interesting in that they look, as far as we can tell, identical to each other. Every other pup we've seen has had a unique design to them, but these are like a homogenized breed or something. Maybe they're clones, even. Hey, clones can still marry each other. Why not? Or perhaps they're lab-engineered pups created to serve as the militia, but are still allowed to live regular lives for the most part. Or maybe it's simply that over time, one lineage of pups resulted in a population with a homogenized gene pool where the individuals look quite similar to each other when seen through our regular old human eyes. In Wolfhard's drawings, Gibbon calls one of them Sun, but that's a generic term of low-key affection to those younger than you, so it doesn't exactly validate any ideas about these pups being Gibbon's own spawn. Honestly, there's a ton of possibilities, and feel free to propose your own ideas in the comments. There's no clear right or wrong answer, just speculations. Okay, let's move back to the topic of Gibbon, because some stuff went down in that doggo's life, and the consequences rippled out across pup kind. Somehow, at some time, someone stole Gibbon's pee pee power. I personally have no idea who this could be, as I haven't picked up on any potential clues, but if you think I missed something, let me know in the comments. I think it's very likely this event happened many years after Gibbon attained immortality through the Ice Crown's Jewel, because I bet Gibbon seeking out and acquiring the ability to extinguish pup powers was a direct result of the theft of his own power. Gibbon got his power jacked, and as a result, decided every other pup should have their power jacked as well by him. So Raisin, pup number 7006, still has her power, but the next series of pups Wolfhard drew are all above number 31,000, and all of their powers are EAB, extinguished at birth. With the exception of Beth, of course, but more on her later. So, at some point in time between the birth of Raisin and the birth of Supremo, Gibbon learned the ability of pup power extinguishment, which itself is also very mysterious in origin, and I have no clue how he may have developed this, but with enough magic, I guess anything is possible. I assume Gibbon wanted to learn this ability because if he couldn't have his pup power, no other pups should be able to have theirs either, but I guess pup powers being potentially catastrophic in their power levels may also have played a role. Maybe Gibbon wanted more stability in the pup kingdom. Now let's finally get around to pup number 38,000, Her Highness Bethany Burrito Jackson IV, or as she calls herself, Beth the Pup Princess. Her official name confirms that the Pup Kingdom does indeed have some form of royal line, and that Beth is indeed the heir to the throne. It's not a title she merely made up for herself, because she's the one who sings the new intro. However, Beth is a wanted fugitive. She's seen as an enemy of the kingdom, and this obviously has to do with the fact that her pup power was never extinguished by Gibbon. Perhaps her parents managed to get her away from Gibbon in hopes that one day, after Beth grows up, she would overthrow the current structure of the pup kingdom, but obviously the details are all up to our own imaginations, and I'm simply proposing my own idea. All we really know is that Beth is aware of her lineage, and thus she's probably aware of how the Pup Kingdom views her. In the opening to Come Along With Me, we see one of the spacesuit-wearing pups spying on the cabin where Beth and Shermie currently reside, which should spell trouble for the two. I guess it's possible the Pup Kingdom is merely keeping tabs on Beth and not actively trying to capture her, although I'm not sure why Gibbon's forces wouldn't just go all in once they know Beth's place of residence. Maybe the Pup Kingdom is engaged in multiple squabbles on multiple fronts and thus its resources are spread thin, or maybe Shermie and Beth will actually have to find a new place to live in the near future. I just don't know. Even with Wolfhard's notes and drawings, ultimately we have just a few details 
with a ton of missing pieces. But I also think that's what makes The Land of Ooh in the future so fun. It captures the imagination because you can't help but wonder and speculate about how things came to be this way, what happened to the characters we knew, and of course, what's the story of the new characters? There's far more questions than answers, but with Adventure Time, I wouldn't want it any other way. I hope you had fun speculating alongside me in this video, and I hope to see you when I finish my review of Come Along With Me.